Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at a new mini PC. This is the B-Link U59, and this one is powered by an Intel Jasper Lake processor. And this is continuing the lineage of these low-powered, inexpensive chips. The prior generation was called Gemini Lake. And we're going to take a look at what this mini PC can and can't do in just a second. But I do want to let you know, in the interest of full disclosure, this came in free of charge from B-Link. However, nobody is paying for this review, nor is anyone reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it was uploaded. And all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. So let's get into it now and see what this mini PC is all about. Now, the price point on this starts at $279. The base model comes with 8 gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage. This one costs a little bit more than the base model and came with 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes of storage. Now, a little bit earlier, we took it apart, and as you can see, you can upgrade the RAM. Ours came with two sticks of eight gigabytes for a total of 16. The entry-level version will have two sticks of four for a total of eight. You definitely want to have that RAM installed in pairs for the best performance. That will put the machine into dual-channel mode. And then you'll see a little heat sink there at the top, that white thing. Uh, that's where the M.2 SATA drive lives, and you can upgrade that as well. It does not appear to support NVMe drives, so you need to put in an M.2 SATA drive, but you can upgrade it if you need more storage. And as you can see, as we slide things down here, uh, there is room for a 2.5-inch SATA drive as well. So you can have one drive installed in that M.2 slot, and another one uh, installed there on the back of the case, and that would be a more traditional laptop uh, two and a half inch SATA drive, and those are pretty inexpensive these days. So you do have a good amount of storage that you can cram uh, inside of this. Additionally, you can upgrade the Wi-Fi. That lives underneath the M.2 SATA there, and it comes with AC Wi-Fi on board, uh, but if you wanted to go to Wi-Fi 6 later, you could very easily pull that card out and install a new one. It does have an Intel card installed on it. Now, this one is running with the maximum RAM configuration, which is 16 gigabytes. It does, of course, support DDR4 RAM, and the maximum memory speed is 2,933 megahertz. On the front here, you've got a bunch of ports. We've got two USB 3 ports along with a USB Type-C. This Type-C port is full service, so this will send display out 4K at up to 60 hertz. It will also, though, take power in to power the device. So you could actually plug this into a docking station if it supports that and get everything going off that single port. And, of course, the port will support data devices in addition to power and video, so that was a nice surprise on there. On the front here, we've got a headphone microphone jack along with the power button. You can clear your CMOS memory by sticking a pin in the front portion there. Uh, there's nothing on the side here. There is some vents for the fan, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, you have gigabit Ethernet here. We tested this earlier, and it could run at a full gigabit. It wasn't getting held up at all. You have two more USB 3 ports here, along with two HDMI outputs, and both of these will also support 4K at 60 hertz. This chipset will support a maximum of three simultaneous displays running at 4K60 if you want to do that. Uh, then, of course, you got your power uh, here if you wish to power it off its included power adapter. The power adapter goes up to about 36 watts total. I found in my testing on the device here, it usually idles around 9 watts or so, and when it's going full bore, it's running at about 15 watts, give or take. There is a fan on it. It's not very loud, but you're going to hear it. And I found that the fan on this thing is constantly changing its speed based on what the processor is doing. So you'll hear that fan ramp up, and then it'll slow down, and then it'll ramp up again. It might be annoying if you're somebody who's very sensitive to fan noise, so just be aware of that. But the fan overall is not loud. It just changes its speed constantly uh, depending on what you're doing with the computer. Now what I want to do is get this thing hooked up to my display, and we're going to take a look at how it performs doing the basics, and we're going to have it connected to a 4K 60 hertz display so you can see exactly how it'll do at its highest supported resolutions. Let me get that set up, and we'll be right back. All right, so we are booted up right now, and I've got it running at 4K 60 as you can see here, so we're running at the maximum resolution out of one of those HDMI ports in the back. 
And I thought we would start off with a real basic task here, which is loading up the Google Chrome web browser and heading over to the NASA.gov homepage. And as you can see on Ethernet here, it loads things up very quickly. It renders very quick. And this despite the fact that we're running at 4K60 here, which should be a challenge for a mini PC like this. But this one feels a lot zippier than the prior generation Gemini Lake chips we were looking at a year or so ago. So altogether, from a web browsing perspective, this feels really good. And I think that's kind of the target for this computer. It's really out there as a low-cost PC to do PC stuff like this, not so much the high-end gaming or video production work. And I would say probably not so much on the media streaming either, which we'll get to in a little bit. Now, I also was able to get Microsoft Office up and running on here, and we'll load up a quick document and give you a sense as to how that works. So we'll pull this up real quick. Again, we're still at 4K60, and as you can see, everything is just very responsive as we're working on this document here. So for doing the basics, I don't think you're going to have any trouble uh, getting those basics done. And even with 8 gigabytes of RAM, you're going to have plenty of memory uh, to get a lot of these tasks completed here. So I was pretty happy with its overall performance. And we'll pop into this Excel uh, app here and see how that calculates. And all in, just a very good basic experience here with the B-Link. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 92.1. That's a pretty big bump over some of the other recent Gemini Lake computers that we reviewed here on the channel. So there's definitely some performance enhancements with this new generation of processor that is making it perform quite well, even at this high resolution. But not everything is perfect. In this example, we've got a 4K 60 frames per second video running from my YouTube channel, and we've got it kind of running in a window here. And as you can see, we're getting a lot of drop frames as that video is playing back. Oddly, though, if I go full screen with it and then wait for the overlays here to disappear, uh, the performance increases significantly. So as we uh, just let this thing kind of settle down now, you can see it's playing back much more smoothly. And although we had a bunch of drop frames at the outset, it's able to keep up now that those overlays are off. And if I just move the mouse here, you'll see that it starts slowing down again and having a hard time keeping up. And I think what's happening here is probably a driver issue. This is a newer Intel chipset, and it's possible the drivers are not fully optimized to work well with Chrome. I did download the latest drivers before I started working on this for the review, and it didn't make much of a difference here. So it looks like this will probably improve over time. The video playback will work fine full screen, just not when you're in a window there. And I also had issues getting HDR video to work on my two HDR-equipped 4K televisions. When I tried to switch it into HDR mode, both TVs just went blank. I even tried to get Netflix working in HDR through its Windows app. That didn't work either, although I was able to get 4K video to output from it. So this is probably not going to work at the moment, at least, as a home theater PC, especially if you're doing 4K video. And I think there's much better options for home theater playback devices out there now beyond PCs. I would recommend the NVIDIA Shield Pro for the enthusiasts, but even an Xbox Series S, I think, would be a much better choice given that it'll do better with games in addition to all the media that you might want to play back on it. But what I want to do now is see how this thing does as a gaming device. So let's take a look at some games that we did manage to get running on this low-powered PC. All right, first up here is The Witcher 3. And when we were doing a live stream, nobody thought we could get this working at all. This is running at 1024 by 768, and it got stretched out a bit here. And we were doing about 15 frames per second at the absolute lowest settings. Definitely not playable. I did, though, get GTA 5 to boot up on this, and we were running this at 720p. And at the lowest settings, we were getting about 20 frames per second or so. Somewhat playable, I guess, but again, not all that ideal with current AAA titles. Uh, next up here is Rocket League, which sometimes can be a little more forgiving. Uh, but at 1080p lowest settings, we were getting about 20 to 25 frames per second. You'd probably get closer to the 30 mark, maybe a little bit above 30 if you ran it at 720p, but again, not ideal. However, Half-Life 2 ran very nice on this, but of course, Half-Life 2 is a very old game. 
Uh, this one was running around 70 frames per second at 1080p, so this was a very playable experience. But for the most part, uh, unless you're doing super old games, uh, this is not going to be something I would recommend as a gaming platform. But there are some things that it can do well on the gaming front, namely emulation. So this is Wave Race running on the Dolphin GameCube emulator, and this was a very good experience with this game and many other GameCube games, actually. Runs at full speed here, it looks and sounds great, no worries there, and I might even be able to tweak some of the graphics settings slightly and still keep a playable frame rate, so that was good. But not everything is going to run smoothly on this one, so I always like to load up Star Wars Rogue Leader whenever one of these new chipsets comes out to see how it does on the Dolphin emulator. And as you can see here, it's somewhat playable, but it does get its uh, lag hits occasionally here, so it's not yet there. Uh, for some of the super demanding games, but I think a lot of the GameCube library will run quite nicely on this little computer. Unfortunately though, PlayStation 2 did not fare as well. I was only getting about 50% performance on Burnout 3 here. I tried a bunch of different configuration settings. As you can see, things aren't looking too good on screen here either, so I think the GameCube is probably the max that you can achieve on emulation, but that does mean there's still a lot of stuff below the GameCube that you can run, like the PlayStation 1 and the Nintendo 64 and all of the other consoles of the 80s. So there's a lot that you can play on here, but all of it is going to be older stuff unless you stream games from a server. Let's take a look at how game streaming performs on this. So this is No Man's Sky running through the NVIDIA GeForce Now service. It was running at a full 60 frames per second. We were connected to Ethernet, of course, which is the best way to experience this gaming service. I have my Xbox controller connected up via Bluetooth, and beyond the usual little bits of lag you feel when you're streaming games, it actually felt like a very nice console-like experience. It was running really, really nicely here. So I think game streaming, whether you're doing it from a service or from a more powerful PC in your home, is definitely something that you might want to check out on this. And on the 3D Mark CloudGate benchmark test, we got a score of 4,577, and that puts this one close to where we saw the Pentium Golds performing about two years ago. So the price is going down, but performance is going up, and that's always something that's great to see. On the 3D Mark Time Spy test, which is a much more demanding benchmark, we got a score of 206, and although that's a very low score, it is better than one of the more recent Gemini Lake refresh chips we looked at recently, and that was on the GMK NUC box, which was a, another little mini PC that we took a look at. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a score of 99.6%, and you can also see the temperature that the computer was running at when that test concluded. And what this indicates is that you won't see a significant drop in performance when the computer is placed under load for a long period of time. It doesn't mean it's going to run all that fast, but it's going to run at the same consistent performance. And I think that might be important depending on the type of work that you're doing on it. Again, you got the fan that's going to be kicking on and off all the time, but that fan is apparently keeping this computer cool enough to operate consistently. Now we're going to take a look at some nerdier topics now, but before we do, I just want to sum things up for the general consumers that are watching. This is a very good general purpose PC for doing the basics like web browsing and Microsoft Office and that sort of thing. If you're gaming, I think an Xbox Series S or a used Xbox One console is probably going to be a better choice. If you are looking for media playback for home theater, I think at the high end, the NVIDIA Shield Pro is still the best way to go. If you're looking at something more affordable, a Roku, a Fire TV, or some other Android TV device in or around the $50 or less price point will, I think, do a better job than this will. But I think for computing purposes, this is a good value and a nice performing one for the price point. I want to dive very quickly into the BIOS here because I know a lot of you will be interested as to what settings are available to you here. You've got a lot that you can tweak here, including its thermal configuration, as you can see. You can really dive into things, mess things up, or improve them, if you will. Uh, so use this at your own risk, but there is a ton of things that you can configure on here, which is always nice to see. And if you're looking to go beyond Windows, we found Linux to run really nicely on this device. We were able to get 
Everything detected properly right out of the gate. That includes Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, audio. The video at 4K60 also worked perfectly on this. And actually, it felt a little zippier on Linux than it did in Windows, to be honest. And I'm sure you can optimize things even further uh, to get it functioning exactly how you want. So this is a nice, fun project computer. And what's great is that you can put so much RAM in it that you could probably have it run as a nice general purpose server for the home. I'm thinking like Docker containers and that sort of thing. So I think it will do well there. On the Geekbench benchmark test, we got a single core score of 627 and a multi-core of 2076. So that should give you an idea as to the kind of processing power you have at your disposal. If you're looking to run a Plex server, this will do well at that because it does have an Intel processor and it supports Intel QuickSync, which Plex really likes for hardware transcoding. So you probably can get, I think, four or five simultaneous 1080p hardware transcode sessions going on this one. It should perform uh, quite well in that regard. It's not going to serve, you know, 50 people, but it will do a household or a small group of friends. So altogether, I think this is a fun alternative uh, to a Raspberry Pi just because you have so many more resources available inside of it and you can even have a Linux hard drive and a Windows hard drive on here because you do have the ability to put two storage options on board. So I continue to be impressed with every revision of these low-end Intel chips and the Jasper Lake is no exception to that. B-Link has implemented it quite well here and I'm looking forward to seeing what else we see uh, running with this chipset in the future. Uh, this is Windows 11 compatible, at least that's what the configuration tool tells me. And if you want to get it off your desk, they even give you a little Visa mount in the box so you can stick it behind your monitor. So all in, a nice little PC here, and I think worth the money if you are looking for a fun project PC. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Hot Sauce and Video Games, Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Thomas Anfang, Jim Tannis, and Handheld Obsession. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.